it's all good. Um, we have about one hour, and then I should have to put my kids to bed about okay about an hour's time. So okay, great. Um, yeah, so maybe um, a good start would be just to you know, explain why um, you know we are where we are, and uh, you you um, you wrote the protocol, and maybe the a little bit of the history of how how that unfortunate event happened, just so other people are aware of that these kinds of things exist. And um, yeah, are we recording now? Yes, we are. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the moral is don't eat cheap sushi. Okay. <laughs> It's expensive in uh, Vancouver. Yeah, there's this. Um, there, I mean, there are a lot of poor people in the world still, and a lot of them have diseases which are dramatically bad um, and which are ignored by the West because they're not, you know, worth much money. They're not really the focus of research, and uh, companies prefer to invest their their time and effort in diseases for wealthy, not the poor. And one of those diseases in Southeast Asia is a little parasite, uh, a little worm which lives in the in the duodenum, and which is um, the life cycle, is it basically it lives in fresh farmed fish, and if you eat the fish raw, and this is a delicacy, is a kind of fermented raw fish or something like that, then the little worm attaches into your duodenum and it sits there for quite some time, and at a certain point in time begins to produce little carcinogens, which produce tumors, which the worm feeds off, because it likes it, because nature is weird like that. And so there's this, yeah, there's this high risk category, which is men at the age of 50 or so, who just basically they turn yellow and they die. And that's the, that's the symptom. And suddenly your, your skin goes yellow, your eyes go yellow, you start peeing yellow, and then in a few weeks later, a few months later, you're dead. And it's cost of doing business, basically, if you're a poor male in Southeast Asia and you eat fresh fish. So I suspect that there's a growing stream of cheap black market fresh fish coming into sushi and, and cheap sushi restaurants, which I used to love, cheap sushi restaurants. And so about five years ago, I began turning yellow and I'm male and 50, roughly. And my eyes go slightly yellow and I'm like, okay, this is not good news. Let's check into the emergency. And they do a scan and they find no blockage in my, in my gallbladder and my liver's fine. And so the only really other option is, uh, is a tumor in the, in the bile duct which it turned out to be a, a cancer, fairly aggressive and fairly uh, far along the way, but not yet metastasized, so still sitting in one space. And so they cut me open and removed this thing. It must have been like, you know, the scene from Alien with this, this thing with many tentacles which they chopped out. And this is a, an amazing procedure called a Whipple where they basically replumb your whole internal system. And that was, that was pretty horrendous. <laughs> Okay. But yeah, I got out of that and recovered from that, and we do. I mean, most of us are pretty robust when you get the chance to be. And the medicine is pretty pretty good. I'm impressed, I have to say, by medicine, modern medicine. And especially in Belgium, where you don't have all this stress about, you know, how are you going to pay for this stuff? The state, the state covers that to a certain extent. You do pay, but it's, it's not going to bankrupt you ever. And um, that was all good. And I had this kind of very freaky few years where I was... You know, I should have been dead, but I wasn't dead. And I knew I should have died because it was really very close both times. I mean, from the, the surgery was really very dangerous and then the cancer was really aggressive. So I spent the next few years in a kind of a state of fugue running around saying, wow, I should be dead, I'm not dead. And slowly sinks in that I'm going to die at some point, but I might as well make the most of it. So um, I decided to become a writer and began writing my books and my blog dates from about that point in time. And we had some interesting projects, but I began to work more and more from home and spend time with my kids. I think everyone um, noticed that you had a pretty much a solid green um, contribution on GitHub. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is shocking to see it sort of stop, obviously, in the last couple of months. But um, it was am amazing to see um, just the amount of contribution from one person. Well, I cheated now and then. The problem with the GitHub thing is it's, it's setting itself up for being gamed. So there's a few days here and there where I missed it. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not going to miss it. So I go back to a project and make a patch and use the date option to backdate that. You know I mean? <laughs> it's, it's asking for trouble, right, when you give people this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I guess we all cheat at certain points. So that was my, my little vice. Yeah. That's why I wrote a script to basically uh, destroy the whole thing with the Pac-Man. Just to, oh, right. That was very fun. What was the name of that project again? Easter egg, just an Easter egg. I don't know what I called it. Waka Waka, that's right. Yeah, that's it. Yes, I, I remember looking at that. 
And uh, it was quite difficult to do because you've got to read the old contributions and build up new values, but you've got to build them up so that they come to a constant because otherwise you get these very bizarre, bizarre effects, all the new added on top. Uh, silly stuff. Yeah, so then uh, beginning of this year, I guess around, around Easter, I, I got sick again and I'm like, uh-oh. Mm -hmm. And it was a bit of a chaotic moment in our family because my dad had just died, so we were obsessed by that and still, we're still figuring that one out. Death is a is a mess, generally. I noticed that. And there's a lot you can do to make death less of a mess. Um, you know, doing things like preparing, just, you know, getting rid of your stuff before you die. I mean, it's very simple, but you get rid of stuff that, that you may appreciate before you die. And then when you're dead, no one has to argue about, you know, who gets it and what you do with it and that kind of thing. So then uh, I got a scan and I got the biopsies and I got other scans and I got blood tests and they were like, yep, you have, you have cancer in both lungs and it's the same cancer, come back, bile duct cancer in your lungs, which is pretty awful news because there's no chemotherapy for bile duct cancer. Like no one has really spent much time on this. So it's this is an experimental yeah. treatment than what you're going through right now. They didn't tell me quite how experimental it is or quite how much data they have. And they spent about a week. I, was, I had pneumonia from the biopsies. I got pretty sick from that. They're, they're poking holes in your lungs and, you know, bacteria move around. They shouldn't be there. So I got very sick from that. And then they were looking at, for a week and a week and a half, what kind of chemo could we use? And they found some data somewhere suggesting that a chemo which is used for colon cancer called Folfox actually might work for bowel duct cancer with a bit of luck. So that's what they are giving me. And it turns out that it's actually working. It is. I don't know how well it's working, but it's doing something. I'm, I, should, I should have been dead by now, by my own estimate. Yeah, from from your initial, yeah. um, the news was was horrific to hear how aggressive yeah. it was. So um, you know, I always told you I kept my fingers crossed that yeah, yeah. don't don't ever give up on anything, and uh, you know, you're putting faith in well, if you want to use that word, oh. into you know what what is uh, what's out there and the science that's going on. So I'm very happy ecstatic and i'm sure everyone else is to hear that that well the science is very good but the science doesn't care about individual cases you no know, the science course. is focused on data and collecting statistics and in you know there's a lot of a lot of gaps in there and all you have even in this case i don't even have statistics i don't know what the chances really are so i'm very happy to not be getting worse i'm getting yeah, a little absolutely. bit better slowly yeah. better and uh, i mean if even if in the worst possible sort of outcome that it doesn't work anyway at least like you said before there's um more more data at least um that's one yeah. of the things you said right in the article right 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 and the medical machine works by massive 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 parallel concurrent trial and error it has these procedures which it applies very very systematically and they can be wrong in individual cases but it applies them and when it gets data that shows where they're wrong it will improve them and over time, it's, you know, people keep sending me these emails suggesting, you know, I should try this and try that, this diet and this alternative and acupuncture and I don't know, whatever else. Smoke some weed, it'll do you good, dude. And I'm like, yeah, all that stuff is fun, but you're, you, can't, you can't compare a handful of individual cases against the medical machine. It's just like, yeah. this is not a fair fight, you know? Um, and I do so trust you, that machine. You, you did give up sugar, correct? Uh, or, is this some, or is this something you did already? I gave that up a long time ago. Oh. When I was 15, I realized that was, that was not I good for Myself, yeah. 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 yeah, I'm actually eating sugar again now because I really, really need the empty calories. Like, that's my body really needs that right now. <laughs> a question, of, a question of energy at this point for just to be able to get through the treatments. Um, I've got to, I have, you know, the chemo is quite interesting. So it's basically one, one, one terrible week and one great week. And you yeah, basically go through these cycles. Week. Is it ever two weeks? Are you going back in weeks, uh, yeah. next, uh, like uh, this week? Yeah, Wednesday. Okay, so, so you've got a couple of good days left um, to enjoy before. Yeah. Why does it take a little bit to take effect and you're still okay on a Wednesday and a Thursday? It's a sign curve. Okay. So it's, it, it doesn't hit immediately. It hits after a couple of days and then it's just, oh, I sleep all the time and I'm vomiting and I'm not eating. And If you, if you touch my stuff, I'll rip your throat out. It gets, oh. it gets into your mind when you don't sleep well. Yeah, no, no. I'm tired and uh, and then you get better and better and everything begins to you know the, the things come back into color in 3d and food begins to taste again your taste buds stop you know, well, the, one of the benefits of you um 
needing to go through this in your life is the um, the protocol for dying, which was um, a huge right. article and had a, a worldwide impact, I would say, given the huh. fact that people have interviewed you about it on television and other places. I was on television twice in Belgium, once in French, once in Dutch. Um, it seems, I mean, we're all affected by it. The Guardian wrote an article, correct? Yes, The Guardian, yes. Yeah. Um, lots of translations. Everyone is, is touched by this. Of course, death is a, very, is a very general thing. We all experience it secondhand and then firsthand in one way or another. And it's, I saw this with my dad when he died. It was very difficult to know what to do as a family. There's very little advice out there of how to, how to even organize, how to even you know, deal with it. Um, I'm sure there are lots of blogs and so on you could look for, but th simple things like, um, you know, get a list of all your assets and bank accounts and stuff before you die. Don't wait until you're dead and start hunting this stuff down. Don't make bizarre wills unless you want your family to fight. Um, and he had euthanasia, which was, a, which was a good thing. He needed it. He was very, very old. And he really had no, no life except lying in bed, losing control over things. And... As a family, we were able to use that to kind of plan things, and it was very healthy, I thought. It was very good for us. Not to have to just wait passively until he died, but actually be able to, you know, hold a party and come together and have the children there and, you know, do this, and then he, then he died. And it was a very, very tidy and also, I think, very healthy way to, to have control. So that's also what I wanted to write about, the positives of that. People are very afraid of, I don't know, death panels and, you know, assisted suicide. And it's, it's really not that. I mean, it's really about taking control. Well, we're, wired, we're wired to fear death as a, as a species. Just, you know, pro keep ourselves going. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's just a little thing in the brain that doesn't want to die. But once you realize that it's really not about whether or not you die, it's how you live, which is, which is really important. And we tend to forget that, don't we? Yeah. So, yes, inspirational words. Haha. <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's always inspirational words and I'm from my point um, I've obviously followed a lot of what you've done because of Zero MQ and a lot of the sort of how our paths I came across all your work and uh, to have met you last year was, was a tremendous uh, tremendously was awesome great. experience because uh, you know of everything that I thought was more than reinforced about how um, amazingly outgoing and um, uh, you know everything you write about about how you, you how you live about the social aspects where you were an introvert before like I was myself I was a geeky kid with the glasses and bullied etc I really identified with everything that you sort of said and, and how, how you turned out because I, I also find a tremendous stimulation about you know social things so what you wrote about the community is incredible um, yeah, we had a great time in Vilnius yeah. it was it was fantastic Yes, um, it was very good. And what um, you, I, yeah, what you what you realize when you meet a lot of people. I spent the last five years doing a lot of conferences, and I'd done that before, but not never quite so focused. And what you realize is that most people are lovely. I mean, it's it's kind of confusing. We have the, we make these broad generalizations. You know, all these are that, and all these are this. But it turns out that most people are lovely, and most people are 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 great to work with and are always motivated to be, you know, uh, good actors. And that's kind of the core philosophy of our community is, it's not to trust everybody. It's just to, like, like medicine, you know, we have the data. We know that this percentage of people are going to be good for the community. And that percentage is going to be bad for the community. And we want to filter them out rapidly, bring in the good, and then free them to do the right thing. I, I see a lot of that in all the open source, obviously as your MQ being open source and a lot of other endeavors that you've done have been open source. And, you know, one of the things uh, that would be nice to, to get uh, from you is your outlook, just the philosophy. I mean, you've fought the patent system, the edge network you've started, you've done a bunch of um, other things. I think the edge network kind of got uh, sidetracked because of the Tor initiative. Correct me if I'm wrong on this, but maybe we could dive into a little bit of you know, the open source side and what drives you, you know, why does, why does Peter uh, use, uh, his, he's not one of those developers with a MacBook Pro sitting there hacking away on Ruby on Rails. 
he's a guy that's got some interesting tech behind him and maybe go into that whole uh, philosophy of why as a consumer you chose to make these choices to use certain equipment and use certain tech or not use certain tech. So I guess we all have a journey, don't we? I mean, we don't make, sometimes we can make big decisions, but I think they're always, they're always built out of small steps. And so first of all, open source as a, as a choice. And I, I realized very clearly at a certain point, maybe I was about 40 years old, that all of my closed source projects were dead. Like literally you would, you would get money from a customer, they would, you would build stuff with them, they would use it and then it would die. And you're a supplier and their goal was to replace you. And I had a very, very few customers whose goal was to build a long-term relationship and pay maintenance. I had one or two that would pay maintenance for 15 years, but they were the exceptions. And the majority of customers were, okay, you're, you're our plumber, you're our lawyer, you're a pure cost, and you come in, you build the stuff, and then we will use it, and then you will go away. And as soon as we can, we'll replace your stuff with something else because that's what companies do. They like spending money. And the open source stuff that I'd made before when I was still ideologically motivated survived. And I'd be making tools open source because well, it wasn't really ideology. I wanted to use them in my work and I couldn't sell them. So I said, okay, I might as well make them open source. Before that, it was freeware and shareware. Yeah. And then I realized, okay, GPL. And I would use these tools, tools like Libero and we made me GSL because they were really, really necessary for the work I wanted to do. They made me a good consultant. They made me a much better uh, developer. So the tools themselves were, were, were free to share and then GPL and then other licenses. And then I came back and I had a lot of, you know, you build a company, you make money, you have to earn money, you have to pay for stuff. So I went back, back into commercial software development. And I realized afterwards it was just the years of my life that were lost. And I guess my ego doesn't like that. My ego likes to think that the stuff I make will survive. I thought I had good ideas, which is kind of true up to a point. I shouldn't flatter myself. Anything. Some of them are good. <laughs> Some are really bad. But the notion that your stuff just is, is trash and it's just temporary is kind of offensive. I thought we could do better. And so I began really deliberately saying, okay, um, open source is the only way to go. And, and then if I, would, if I would waver on this, I would get the sharp reminder. I had a company in Poland, Wikidot, which still survives. But the company never really became a success. And the core reason was that the platform was closed source. And so you have this small company and all of its money goes into software development and customer support. And that's, that's lethal. If you're building your own software by yourself, you can't compete. And the irony is that, of course, the whole stack is based on open source, but it's not open source. Right. So, so that okay, goes into the platform argument about um, just why you're not using closed source, um, if possible, um, equipment. I mean, every time I see a tweet at some crazy gadget that you have attached to some um, Android phone <laughs> trying to get better battery life and whatever else you were up to. We're, we're doing, we're doing some, some IoT stuff with little routers, which is really fun. Um, but that's kind of the EdgeNet thing, so that's... Right. And that's still, it's still alive. That, that, that concept didn't go away. It was really a kind of a concept that I wanted to send into the, into the world and see what happened to it about decentralized, decentralized communications. Um, so once you've, once you've decided that open source is the thing, then you have, of course, a lot of discussions about, you know, what's the best license and best means what gives you the best results. That's been also a very long journey, um, lots of trial and error. And then at some point you're like, okay, how do we organize? And if you're like, if you're the kind of person that likes to organize other people, which I do, I'm, I'm a good organizer, then you're obsessive about what makes your team better? What makes your people work better? You know, you, you, you have people that you like to work with who are there either because you're, you're paying them or preferably because they're, they're motivated by their own economics, which is much better. Then how do you get them to work better? And you're trying to solve problems all the time. And I guess out of years and years and years of solving these problems, we finally came to a model which seems, it's still evolving, but it seems kind of state of the art for what we have right now and optimal for what we can do for collaborating together. And I think that's the really fun aspect of ZeroMQ is you join any project that uses these rules and it's, it's pleasant. Things, work, things are smooth, your, your pull requests get merged quickly, um, things improve quickly, people work with you happily. There's very little argument because no one needs to make assumptions and fight other people. There's no 
ideology going on at all. There's no need for people to argue ideas. It just isn't there. It's and I think a, that's a yeah. different uh, approach. So many people, obviously, I've been arguing with people about C4 now <laughs> since you've announced yeah. it because I find that I have to uh, really um, explain to quite a, a, lot, a far extent as to just how easy it is to let go of the previous dogma of reviewing pull requests and being a gatekeeper. Yeah, like I made a, it's just amazing sometimes. I made a pull request for, to change a readme in a project, on a Node.js project, just to add a small section with documentation of the command line options. I thought that was simple. I made a pull request. I sent a new version of readme.md with a patch for that. And there's like 20 comments on that about indentation and about the, and I'm like, well, you know, how do you indent when your options are, you know, 20 characters long? It doesn't work anymore. How do you align these into columns? You can't. I did my best. If you want to improve it, just make a new patch. It just seems, you know, if you have an opinion, improve it, obviously. Show me where I'm wrong. But no, 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 no. The pull request, I think it's still there. I don't think it got merged after about, you know, about four months. It's still waiting there. So how, how can a project survive when it's rejecting even cosmetic changes like that? It's, and that's, that's the norm. That's the thing, the way things normally go. Yeah. You, you set the bar so that a new contributor has to be perfect. Otherwise, you reject them. And the consequence is that, well, no one is perfect when they start in a project. So you're basically setting that up for failure. I'm certainly getting my um, education about it through uh, Yuri's work on, on that one project. <laughs> he's, who's, he's definitely put in the C4 from the beginning. And uh, it's amazing to be able to just sit on your phone and just say accept, accept, accept. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Way easier. <laughs> and it's fun. And it's fun. And it makes things you know joyful. And everybody is having fun. And that's just like, it's just an amazing thing, this experience of, of connecting to people, even though, you know, just through the, the satisfaction of, yes, good thing, I like it. And it's like, we're voting on each other's work, but we're doing it by merging their pull requests rapidly yeah. um, and improving them. And if you don't like someone's chain of thought, you just ignore it, which is easy to do, and then it just dies. And that's, that's nice, that's what you want. And there's no reason to or fight with it, you just ignore it and it just sits there and doesn't get improved and eventually gets removed. Yeah. And if you like someone's train of thought, you invest in it. So it's a, it's a very natural way to build up kind of a consensus over time. Um, yeah, it's just... It's funny how different problem sets get, uh, uh, get different, well, they criticize it in a different way. One that mm -hmm. I was dealing with was one where there's uh, filters for uh, TV shows, for example, because um, different torrents, et cetera, you get different uh, formatting for the way the episodes are numbered and named and right. and all this kind of stuff. And so I was actually just this week arguing about C4 with uh, with this open source project that does the parsing of all these things. And he was so adamant about, you know, not letting someone screw up the build. So, you know, my argument was to say, if you want a stable one, why don't you, you know, branch off of a previous part of master and have that as a supported version. And his argument was that people are just used to taking, you know, master and that being good. So how, yeah, but how it's, would you it's, it's a false dichotomy. Of? Like you, you can you can take master and it can be good and you don't have to fork anymore. We've we've solved that problem. Um, what you do is you define a good build, you know, you define it by CI, continuous integration testing. And you do that across as many platforms as you care about. If you want to support Windows and OS X and Android and Linux, then you do four parallel CIs. And if you want to support single-threaded builds and multi-threaded builds, then you do that as well. And you, you, I think for ZeroMQ, we have hundreds of CIs running on any part of the projects you know, at any point in time. And then the CIs come back and they report status. And they're like, OK, we'll flag this and this and this is green and there's a red. And that defines stability. And if your CI isn't complete and it's not testing everything, then you fix your CI, you fix your tests until they actually are the contract with the outside world. How do you, you require prevent people from so. deleting uh, tests and say, hey, CI is working, but you kind of go back and say, hey, this guy just deleted a whole bunch of these regex tests for whatever. I'm using that silly example again. Um, but how do you do that? Is that, is that just another bad actor and you have to get That's a bad actor. and. The, I mean, the cheap answer is, well, you let them do it and then you fire them. You give them rope and then you hang them with it. 
um, if it's a problem, we never had, we've had that problem, I think, one time in ZeroMQ, and it was an accident, and that's forgivable. So as a deliberate strategy to introduce bad stuff into a project and then, you know, get sneak out a stable version people will use and which will have your magical breakage in there. Right. C4 works on the basis you have to have small patches. They have to be specific. They've got to be targeted. If you start having large patches which are a bit vague, people will catch quickly and they'll be like, no, 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 this stuff stinks. Or there's a bunch of stuff deleted. Why is this? There's a bunch of files. Yeah. Or yeah. Only minuses, so, pluses. <laughs> How are you contributing? <laughs> I mean, code review is one thing, but reviewing the patch is a different level. It's like, what files are you changing? How are you describing these changes? How much have you changed? And what's your rationale? And that's, you can check that in, in 30 seconds on a mobile phone. It doesn't take deep inspection. Yeah, exactly. Right. The other answer is, if you're really, really afraid of this, if you're like paranoid that if you actually have enemies who you are aware of that are going to try to attack you, then you have a separate test project. So you simply separate out the concerns. You have implementations there, and you have tests there. Like I have a HTTP server, and I'm providing my own test cases, and I prove that I am this fast and this conformant. Well, you can't trust the vendor. Fair enough. Right. You have external tests, and they test the server, and then you can, you can catch all kinds of things. So if you're really concerned about the contract, and it's got any kind of importance to you, you do that externally, and then you can't delete tests. So it's definitely a scoping thing for C4 then for certain types of projects. They can I don't, of yeah, but I don't think C4 cares about this. I mean, this is, C4 is concerned about how to build a community primarily through using code as your communication mechanism. How you avoid people from violating contracts and so on is, I think, we might, we might add it. I mean, it, it, it still seems a theoretical concern at this point. And we like to not solve problems we don't actually have or haven't actually experienced. Yeah. So uh, while we're on the subject of zero MQ uh, in passing, um, one of the things that I've had happen since I started uh, using that for my projects about five years ago um, was uh, obviously the place of something like uh, zero MQ in a more of a traditional line of business application where it replaces uh, a traditional uh, message bus for pumps right. and the guaranteed delivery argument. You probably hear this argument. Uh, you know, if I hear it all the time, you probably hear it about a thousand times. So I was wondering about your uh, outlook on how to separate concerns. To me, and you know, correct me if this is an entirely wrong way of thinking, is that I see the um, the message delivery as a separate concern from the uh, any kind of persistence of those messages, specifically within queues. Um, I just think it's moving a problem to the wrong place in the system overall. So how do you address that problem that zero MQ doesn't uh, provide a persistence mechanism except in memory as these endpoints? Well, I mean, in software, you have to be layering stuff. If you're not layering and if you can't think in terms of layers, then you're, you maybe shouldn't be in the business of making software. That's the first thing. It's like any engineering. If you If you think that the person selling you concrete is also going to design your bridge for you, then you're probably not in the business of you know, civil engineering. Mm -hmm. So zero MQ is at the level of uh, concrete. It's at the level of connecting pieces. Now what these pieces do is not zero MQ's concern. And you're, if your connectors try to be persistent or even try to be reliable, then you are doing things in, in the wrong way. And it, will, it, it may work. You can build bridges out of cardboard and they will look pretty, but they won't survive if you walk across them. So zero MQ is, is, is a mechanism for connecting pieces using whatever transport you like. It can be unreliable UDP, it can be reliable TCP, it can have different levels of reliability. Throwing away data, so unreliable delivery, is really, really important in some cases. If you're doing pub sub and you try to persist or try to hold on to stuff, your systems will crash. That's why your routers, your Wi-Fi routers, throw away packets. And it's like saying, let's, let's attach hard disks to internet protocol. Yeah, it's the same level of, of, of thinking. Let's have a spinning rust on our, on our little router just to catch lost packets. Because you don't want to be resending packets, right? That would be terrible. Right. Well, it turns out that having a spinning hard disk on your router would be really insane. I don't think anyone's even tried that. That's how insane it is. So that's the level of, of, of debate here. It's a level of debate. Let's put spinning rust on our IP router. 
Well, I think I think some people put an operating system on their routers and make it a NAS of some sort. <laughs> you can do that. I mean, if that, that's that's Linux. Just being facetious here. <laughs> it, it runs on anything, but yeah. okay. So then you you layer on top of the of top of the plumbing and you make pieces which can do queuing. And queuing is a very important facet of messaging because it lets you have producers and consumers who are not there at the same time. So at a certain point in distributed systems, you need queues, centralized queues, for certain use cases. When you have a very when you have asynchronous presence, you have a request from an application to do something uh, to a printer, and the printer is offline, and then the application switches off, and then the printer comes back online. You've got to have a queue between them, a third party. So third party queuing mediation between pieces is is an essential tool in your in your box as an architect. And that's a broker. So you have a broker there at some point in time. And most zero MQ architectures at some point in time have brokers. So, so that's you, the standard uh, answer to the, um, you know, if you're using zero MQ instead of uh, Rabbit or some other yes. hub sub system, you just implement your own um, broker in between. It depends because there are the majority of the majority of use cases are not do not need brokerage. So the majority of data being sent around the world is transient, the temporary data where, like we're talking now, if you're not there, there's no point for me being there. This is the majority use case where producers and consumers are present and if they're absent, they're just not there. They've missed it. You're not going to queue a video conference. It's not going to happen. You're not going to queue a phone call. You will queue an SMS. But voice traffic is way more than, than, than text traffic still today, I think. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe it's changing. So, you know, if you have a RabbitMQ or some broker there and you want to replace it, you, use, you see what you're doing. And the pops up stuff, which is the majority of, of traffic, ZeroMQ will do that for you just out of the box. You literally open it up, plug a piece into your publisher, and plug a piece into your subscriber, and they talk and they're doing everything perfectly. And then you have your reliable brokered messaging. At that point, you need queues. Yeah. And then you have different kinds of queues. So the queues can have different implementations in your broker. You can have queues which are transient. That's to say, if your, if your broker process crashes, you lose your data. And if your broker process doesn't crash, you won't lose your data. If your queue gets too large, you'll lose data. Eventually, it will crash the system. But in most cases, that will work fine. If in most cases where you have queuing, then you expect pieces not to be crashing, and brokers should be running on systems that don't crash. And they should be tuned to a point where it doesn't matter what you throw at them, they do not crash. And they should be simple enough to not crash. So it's far better to invest in simplicity at that point than persistence. If you make your broker product more complex and add in all the stuff that needs to, reading and writing from hard disk all the time, bum, 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 bum then not only does it get much, much slower, it also gets much more fragile. And your risk of a crash goes much goes up dramatically. So even then, reliability comes from simplicity most of the time, not from adding in more, more and more features. But let's say that you have a case where you absolutely need to be sending to disk because you, uh, I don't know, you have a, con a contract with Seagate or something and you absolutely want to be writing on disk. And you don't care about performance. And then, um, then you can make persistent queues, and you can start adding in transactions and, you know, three-phase commits and all that stuff, and you can start doing all means, you know, 100 per second kind of rate of stuff. It's really amazing how fast you can go. Yeah, I've and seen a lot of things where they layer over uh, ACK messages to go back yes. and heartbeats and things like that. Is that in the, is that the responsible way to uh, to meet an SLA? Um, just the basic uh, no op heartbeats being uh, published, just so, so that. Uh, subscribers on their own know that they're not dealing with a, with a dead publisher? Well, you do that in any case because you want to be... The TCP won't tell you when a, when a process has died. It won't tell you when a process is looping and busy. So heartbeating is, a, is important. We do heartbeating actually in, in 0MQ between pieces in the last version of the protocol. Um, and the last version of the library does heartbeating. It won't help you in all cases. It won't help you. If your heartbeating code is alive, but the application is blocked, then you don't know about it. It's how do you intertwine uh, those two so that it actually represents yes. you know, being yes. alive? Yeah. 
Um, and and what, you, what you figure out fairly quickly if you're building this kind of system is that the concept of reliability is a slippery one. You can't actually have guarantees. There is no guarantee delivery. You can eventually aim for at least once delivery. So if you don't get it, eventually you complain, you ask again, you get it one more time. That's the very best you can get. There's no guarantee of one single delivery of anything. It's just not technically possible. It's not physically possible. And anyone who tells you that they're doing it is lying or ignorant. Yes. There's a lot of vendors. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lying <laughs> and, and ignorant often, but OK. Um, so the guarantee delivery is a, is a yeah. I mean, it's, it's good business for vendors eh, if you want to be that kind of customer. Yeah, we had, uh, so uh, on that topic of keeping things simple as ZeroMQ does, it keeps um, the delivery of the messages separate from these other concerns, rightfully right. so, and I, I, I totally see the point. I'm getting really tired of arguing with people about it, <laughs> but I still do. Um, on, on the same topic, I, I'm looking at uh, just a way of organizing projects we touched on the C4, and one of the uh, things that obviously I had a, um, an interesting run in with it is because a lot of what I've done has um, relied on branching and not not for the, right. the reason that people might think that I think branching is important that uh, that people keep their work out of being integrated for a long time. I'm, I'm actually trying to replace concepts like uh, large vendors like uh, Atlassian and Jira to be able to see how the project's going. Um, so. Uh, with, instead of using that tool, we already have the repositories telling us what's done, what, what's being currently worked on, and what, what's left to do. Um, in terms of project um, leveraging, you know, uh, something that's a single source of truth, like like the repository itself, to manage where things are at. How do you, how do you think that compares to uh, this sort of everyone just commits to master as often and as quickly as possible. Is there room for um, other uh, pieces in the repository to reflect or make, you know, other things such as heavy tool like Jira redundant? So a process like C4 isn't, I mean, it's no, it's no silver bullet. The thing is that it only works if you can, if you can organize according to those practices, if you have existing organization, existing processes, then you, you probably can't use C4. I mean, you have to have a team that you can shape in, you know, from raw material. I've used it actually internally in commercial projects and it works. It's not about open source as such. And the first version of C4 was uh, something called PC3, um, pragmatic contract for code construction or something. I don't know anymore, but it was for a commercial project that we wrote for Samsung. And it solved our problems of communicating and it solved our problems of issue tracking and it solved our problems of um, dealing with teams in different time zones. And our problem was that we had an American design team and a uh, European development team and a Korean testing team. And the Americans would send us a 35 page PDF with new designs. And then the, we would try to implement it. And then the Koreans would send us a 35 page PowerPoint with their bug reports. And that was a communication process. Wow. And it didn't work. I mean, I can tell you that was a, that was a nightmare. And it took about, well, it took several months of, of fairly brutal fighting. And we got them to agree that we would get problem statements from Korea. We would get input from the design team from America one by one, and we would send patches. The Koreans would then test, and that would go around in a circle. And when that began working, it was beautiful. So we, we did have to do a lot of work to destroy the existing process and destroy people's perception of what they were. They were no longer UX and UI. They were part of a development team and they would make small contributions to small features, the designers. And the Koreans had to stop thinking in terms of PowerPoint and stop thinking in terms of issue tracking. There were, no, there were issues, but they were all very, very small and they were closed immediately and they were on GitHub using the GitHub issue tracker. And I had to teach the managers in the project to stop making structure in the project, stop making branches and stop making subdirectories and stop making structure. That was up to the developers to add as they needed. And I had mm -hmm. to kick out all the agile people who came in and tried to teach us how to make software and kick them out as well um, with force. 
and kick out the consultants who came in to tell us. Sorry to interject. Is that because of the, the recent years of uh, Scrum, like Agile turning into the Scrum? Yes, yes, Scrum. And we had these managers who didn't trust us at all and who'd keep sending us teams of consultants to try to help us. Um, so there was a lot of a lot of politics involved and only when that had been dealt with to some extent could we could we actually work the right way. It was not easy. Um, it came down to having a a bunch of repositories, each dealing with one project, each giving one uh, each each having a master which was being tested, with an absolute truth being that master. And we had a very primitive version of, of CI, which was basically large teams of Samsung testers testing this stuff on every different mobile phone. They had 30, 40 mobile phones. They would test it on, come back with errors and things that were misplaced and so on. And we'd fix that. Um, I, I don't know how you could use branches in that kind of structure profitably. Um, and I have, I have a bunch of problems with branches in Git. The, um, apart from being a solution to a problem that I don't see, and that's the first thing, is it's solving a problem which I don't, I don't see. And once, you can, once you've removed the need for isolating people's bad behavior, then you don't have a need to create these things. And what branching seems to do is it first makes your repositories very, very complex, and secondly makes your Git uh, commands, your UI, and your flow very, very complex. If you're dealing with branches and with merging branches and trying to create a history which works, it's nasty. And I've not met many people able to do that properly. And I don't like having dependencies on such a narrow uh, expertise. Because once a person without expertise gets in the project, they own the project. And that's very bad. Would that be... Um... Would that be just the state of Git? I mean, they've added a ton of features, et cetera, tooling around Git itself that's making things uh, more uh, usable. I know the, the typical argument is, uh, well, you have to solve the core root instead of trying to put in these Band-Aids. However, I see Git as being such a simple thing that um, these complexities are, are actually the um, immaturity of things built on top of them. I mean, compare it to zero MQ in the early days. Yeah. You know, even the subscription was handled on the wrong side of the communication, making it chatty and things like this. Right. I mean, I, I would hope that Git would eventually get simpler and the people would, you know. Well, that's the problem. It's simple. <laughs> adopt this. Well, if you remove branches from, you know, from existence, if you don't know the existing, you have no branch command, then about I mean, a vast amount of Git just disappears. You but never at that see point, it. Shouldn't we just use uh, Subversion or something? Uh, ah, uh -huh. so <laughs> now, the reason why branches exist, I believe, is because it's how people were able to map their Subversion models onto Git. And so obviously Git was used as a replacement for Subversion, majority, I and mean, that's how many, many teams did it. And Subversion absolutely needs branches. And that's the reason is that the subversion repository is a major thing. It's like an Oracle database. It's a it's a first class citizen. One repository is is a is a massive thing and requires system admins and it requires permissions and it requires configuration and you have to have files you set up and processes you start and the whole thing is a massive a massive instance. So if you want to have multiple projects in there, eventually you end up with branches. Um, and every SVN repository has branches for reasons which are not really about isolation of, you know, it's not really about the merging we do in Git, but it's a different thing in SVN, it makes sense. Supporting that to Git, which I think, I think happened naturally, people were expecting that kind of feature, creates a very bizarre universe that we've accepted as being normal, but uh, there's a better way. Yeah, what about the there's Linux a... kernel and, and things like this? They seem to have a lot of work being done concurrently, and I think there's a necessity to some extent of having some level of organization, or is this just, is, or is this even more complexity added that could be just... Um, I don't want to criticize Linux kernel. Well, uh, I'm not, I mean, you can criticize but I will. Anyway. it won't matter. <laughs> it's too large. It's, uh, but, uh, you know, something like, uh, let's say, take a extreme case of looking at the Linux kernel, but instead of using branches, using um, I don't know, folders uh, where things get moved over 
um, would that so remove the complexity that's unnecessary there or you could the, pr the problem with linux so i mean the kernel project it dates from a long long time ago it's an yeah. old project it has old culture old customs and these customs made sense at the time and it has not it shifted slightly but it's still you still send your patches to the mailing list mm -hmm. and they're argued and there's you know there's fighting and then eventually they're merged it's it's not really a I would say it's not really a modern community, it's an archaic community, and you see this stress emerging sometimes with the, the kind of the violent rhetoric that you get from that community, which is, I think, a consequence of its structure, not of any particular personality. So just the frustration that people get with the yes, project yes. structure. It brings out the worst in people that ordinarily wouldn't be arguing and uh, right. focusing on the problem. And, right. And, I mean, it should be a collection of projects. It should be a cluster of hundreds of projects by now where anybody can start a new project. Anyone just go to GitHub and start a project. It should take two seconds. It does in GitHub, start a new project. And it should be one where- example of a large one like that? I mean, are there inroads in other things such as uh, OpenBSD or FreeBSD or whatever, um, or any other large-ish things like that that are making you know, the right steps in your opinion that could be looked at? I haven't researched it, but I suspect none of them are. I suspect that the the whole, you know, kernel design, OS design is an old thing, and they're, um, you know, it's very hard to start a new culture in an old project. It's very, very difficult. They say that science progresses one death at a time. You know, you need to be, you need to literally have the, the old guard dying off, literally death, and then young people will come and bring in their new ideas. And there's, there's massive defense of the culture because it seems to be working. Yeah, you know, it's it's you know, why would you change this? It seems to be working. Well, it could be better. No, 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 no. Don't mess with it, something that's working, which is yeah, valid. As but a, as a way to say that, oh well, we're kind of proud that the kernel has progressed slowly because look, it's it implies stability in some way, which is I, I don't buy it myself, but um, that's certainly something that I've seen thrown around. Well, I, I think. Um, it's certainly successful and certainly much better, much, much better than any of the competition. And remember that basically Linux has wiped out, you know, commercial operating system development, which used to mean, it used to mean IBM mainframes and then it met Microsoft. And uh, I think, I think it's, it's won that war uh, with, with ease. It's won that war by bringing in all of the experts in a reasonably open way, but doesn't mean that it's the best way. And, I think that in any inevitably, if you have a culture which is what is it, 15 years old now, more than that, it's going to be redundant. It's going to be archaic in that in that in that length of time. We've learned so much about how to organize, and our tools have improved so so much that we can do much better today. And we're still even with C4, we're still finding ways to simplify it. We're still making improvements. We're removing pieces which are too complex, which we can take out. That's why we're on our third third version by now, I believe. Right, and is it yeah. still the? Um, I remember adding it to a project of mine. Is it what do people usually do to, and you know, if they want to adopt C4, uh, what are their first you know steps, and how do they get started? Well, you have to understand it first of all, because if you're not actually, hmm. yeah, there's definitely a danger of people just saying, "Okay, yes, great, yeah, I'm doing that tomorrow, yeah. everyone, I'm going to announce it yeah. in the office." And <laughs> you have to, you have to understand it, and. There's a, there's a book, Social Architecture, which is kind of the, the, the handbook to this now, and it's, it's free online, Social Architecture. Um, I have no domain name for that. You can also buy the book. It's not a very large one. And that explains the background. And then you really have to be using it on a small project, first of all, and getting some experience with it, in a year or more of experience, and seeing how it actually works, and then you trust it. And once you've seen it, you've been part of it, and you can trust it, then you can coach other people to use it. And evangelize. If you're just doing it on theory, on principle, then when someone challenges you, you'll be, well, I have the book, and it's not going to be enough. It's not going to work. You have to actually be able to go through what happens in cases when, it, you know, when there's conflict and people don't get it, and work them through it, and that means knowing it, and that means internalizing it, that means using it. There's no way around that. So if you don't have access to an existing project, which, I mean, you can join any of our existing projects, come in and you know, be part of it. You can use it on a small project yourself, try to start something and get some experience with it. It'll fail, doesn't matter. 
And then when you've got that experience, then you can start applying it to existing groups. And it requires, it requires power. It requires moving people around and changing their, their self-perception, which is hard work. I can certainly see it being very hard to do within um, enterprisey type of places that um, typically right. are well known for this, making very good contracts between subsystems because that always seems like a you know wasteful work. Um, right. In the enterprises I've had uh, experience with. So in order for you know companies or larger teams of teams, if you will. Um, adopting this, you know, a lot of people go back into the minutia of the source code itself and how it's managed with, you know, well, we have multiple master branches moving forward at different rates and we can never uh, agree on what, what works or what, uh, you know, if it's a stable build in one project, how do we make sure that it's lined up with a stable build of other projects mm -hmm. and that they, you know, what would some of the takeaways be like, you know, if you're going back to, let's say, Samsung with a large set of teams and you have to coordinate and knowing now what you know from that experience with Samsung and what you know with your experience with uh, you know, the Zero MQ project and how things are a little bit different in open source, uh, what would your sort of recommendation be for you know, companies that are trying, at least there are people within those companies that are trying to do that? Right. <clears throat> well, there's a bunch of things we've learned. And for example, you. You can't, I don't think that you can sanely and successfully anymore uh, build a large architecture. And that applies both to software and to organization. That's the first thing. What you can do successfully is you can grow an architecture out of pieces which will organize around each other in different ways. And those pieces have to be independent, competitive, and responsible for their own market. So there's got to be an economy and I've written about this extensively. There's got to be a force, an economic force, that pulls people into the right place in this structure. They've got to be free to move all the time because the economies will change over time quite often quite radically. If you're trying to keep people in one place, then you're going to be stopping that process. And then the projects which are in the right place at the right time get the market, get the success. People can join that at any point. So then the project is responsible for its own, its own supply chain. It's pushing its suppliers to respect contracts. It's investing in the contracts it really cares about. It's testing them. If you have a security library that you're using, then you care about the version of that library, its stability, any issues it may have about that library. But if you're delivering a product which needs that library, then you're caring. And part of your economic calculation is how much work does it take to make that work, that, that contract work. So the contracts are always set and enforced from the client side. The supplier will be lazy and try to avoid that work and try to lie and cheat. That's what suppliers do, even internally. So if you have a team of 100 people, you're basically saying, OK, folks, go off into GitHub. All of you get an account, one organization. These are the rules. You can all start a project at any point in time. Anyone can join your project. People will send you pull requests. You will merge them. These are the rule books for that will go through two or three weeks of coaching, we'll go through these different aspects, we will try them, and the goal is to build a, a bunch of viable, sellable, commercially valuable things at the front end, and there's a supply chain going all the way back, and then you figure out how to reward the supply chain. How does your security library team get value and money and bonuses because they're used in other applications? You can measure all of that, so you can actually measure the use of good pieces through this, this system. And I believe that is more or less how open source, good open source organizes. It's not quite as free and not quite as, as cared for as that. It's maybe a little bit more of a jungle, but it is this supply chain where projects define their own success and people are free to move between projects or they should be. So without the freedom, I'm guessing it's, well, there's a lot of similarities in terms of the, the result. The intended result is more of kind of how Amazon claims have yes. had its success of yes, having yes. forced contracts. But I don't think they've had that uh, freedom to move. It was kind of a top-down approach of we're just going to make these things and uh, or we'll see what, no. what, what things exist and we'll force them to be individual services that we're going to use internally and externally. Is that how? I believe, I believe Amazon... It's a, 
it's a it's a process or a structure or a approach called open allocation, and I believe Amazon had that um, at least for parts of their uh, team. Uh, GitHub had that for a long time. They've stopped that nowadays. GitHub is well, um, they monetize the company and they have issues with code of conduct things and other political things as well. Um, and I think that was taken advantage of to move to a monetization yes. model and. Yes, I mean companies can be worth. You know, they can be uh, seen in different ways in terms of their worth. It can be the, the the worth they produce, or it can be the number of people that they have. It's often in conflict. Um, I like Amazon. I like Amazon a lot. I use Amazon. I'm, I'm very satisfied user of their their different platforms. It's how I print my books. It's how I order my my stuff online. It's it's a company I would buy shares in. And I think one of the reasons is that they've had this model of open allocation for a long time. And it's given them the ability to move into the right area at the right time. Um, you know, like Amazon is sourcing cheap electronics from my favorite stuff in the cheap Shenzhen electronics. They're sourcing that and reselling that. And they're doing it not quite as fast as AliExpress and not quite as fast as eBay, but better than eBay because they give you better delivery, which is what we always care about. Um, so there's, you know, they're, they're, they're very flexible and they're always taking advantage of new, new markets very quickly, which other companies just completely don't do. So um, that's an interesting point with these large companies that are, um, that are, you know, doing things right and some of them are holding on to old. Right. You said an interesting thing. Uh, I think, uh, I forget which podcast that was on, but I've been watching every single interview that you've had <laughs> for, the, for the last five years. And uh, I, one of the things that struck me is that you said that, um, you know, one of, the, one of the most successful companies, Apple, is the one that's actually going to have a demise because of not realizing some of these things of, you know, what's happening with manufacturing in China. And uh, the, whole patent, the whole food. patent system and... Uh, yeah. I, that's one of the things that really interests me is um, all of your um, all of the work that you've had uh, uh, in terms of uh, at least writing and, uh, and guidance around patents and you know especially large companies etc. So you know how how does someone back up a statement that's as crazy as you know most media would say that there's no way that Apple's too big to fail right? <laughs> Sorry for the <laughs> use of that uh, cliche, but. I mean, to some extent, it's true because they have so much cash reserves that they can't actually literally die. Um, you have you have companies like this, the zombie companies, which they you know they exist and they have this massive amount of money in the bank, and their core businesses shrivel, and then they buy other companies and they morph into something else over time. You know, like IBM, for example, which is now a software consultancy company, and it used to be a you know a computer manufacturer. It's a very different business, and it's just morphed and sold off all of its hardware and sold off all of its actual computer-based research and become a, a PricewaterhouseCoopers or something like that. I think they bought a company called Friday or something bizarre. Um, well, Microsoft you know, bought LinkedIn recently. <laughs> yeah, my, Microsoft is one of those as well. And they, they will, you know, Windows 10 is their last Windows, I believe. Officially not. Uh, I'll make that prediction. No, I don't know if it's official or not, but I, think I they, believe. I think they wanted just live updates from now on. I think they actually officially even said that. Ah, they said wrong. that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think they're, I mean, I think they have to admit defeat at this point. Nobody wants Windows 10. They're, it's giving away for free and people are like, stop giving us this stuff. We don't want your spam. You know, it's spam. This is, this is a terrible thing for them that their prize asset is now considered to be aggressive spam and is installed with the, you know, as, as a virus, basically. And why isn't Microsoft in the business of online sales? Why aren't they? I mean, they don't have a hardware division, not one a big one. Why aren't they selling cheap electronics like Amazon is? They should be doing this. Microsoft should be sourcing all the cool stuff. And there's really cool stuff out there. They should be sourcing it and selling it with their brand on. They would make a lot of money from that. They'd make a lot of customers happy. You know, things like these, these stupid cell phones. This is my Xiaomi cell phone. This is an expensive Chinese cell phone. It's $200. You can get a completely functional Android cell phone for $25, single core. And the lowest price I saw for a four core is forty-four dollars. Wow. Okay. Running Android five, forty-four dollars for a four core. So that's what Apple's trying to compete against. How do you compete against that? 
patents? I don't know. People think that. Yeah, <laughs> patents. So that's the traditional answer is well, we won't compete. We'll just make it illegal to compete. Um, we will stop them competing by the force of law. Patents are basically a legal tool to ban competition. That's what they are. That's what they do. They're, look, I own this. I've petitioned Parliament. This was the original patent for the steam engine. And James Watt, business partner, went to Parliament in Britain and said, I want a patent on the steam engine. And they were like, boh, boh, this is bad for competition. And, you know, we are, a, we are a, they were, I mean, there was a very good awareness of the need for competition in the economy. There was a very, very big discussion about patents in, in, in Europe, in the whole of Europe. And it was done by very, very good economists and they weren't naive. But the power of money and the ability to, I presume, slip member of parliaments, members of parliament, little envelopes stuffed with pound notes and 10 pound notes and whatever else won the day, and so they granted him his patent on steam engines. And the whole industrial revolution just stopped for 20 years. It froze, and there was no innovation, and no one made new models because they couldn't without building on what's his patent. Nobody wanted to license his patent. They all hated him. And he made no money. He didn't sell anything. He, well, he sold something, but very little. And then after 20 years, his patent expired, and the steam engine industry exploded, and the industrial revolution took off again. And he made much more money afterwards from consulting than he did before from his, his patent. And it's, it's a classic example, but it's really, it's really quite straightforward, standard, standard model. Patents are tools that lawyers use, and they pretend to be innovators and inventors. But it's a lawyer's tool to hijack the market and try and extort the actual business people making, making you know, new things into paying a tax, a private tax. And if you look at how the patent system has built its, its legal basis, its corruption all the way, it's corrupt from the very beginning. The very concept of a patent is a corrupt legal concept and it's been done by bribing and bullying and blackmailing and threatening and lying. There's no actual economic rationale for patents at all, never has been. It's a system built on lies and corruption. And I mean, that's okay when it's affecting you know, your network plug has 45 patents on it, the RJ45 has 45 patents, or 150 patents, I don't know, on that network thing. It can't evolve. You won't get new versions of that because it's so heavily patented. But okay, that's fine. But when it affects things like, well, our software, then we get very annoyed, very upset. And it affects medicine, it affects pharmaceuticals, you know, it affects the, the ability for companies to innovate. The patent system is a, is a terrible thing. It's a terrible, terrible thing. And it's it has this history of just lying about its just lying about its its rationale. It's like we need this to be able to innovate. If you don't have patents, nobody will make new software. Sounds good, right? It's one, one mind blowing that I've seen in terms of affecting medical uh, science. I mean, this is Karen. I forget her last name. That was involved in the um, Software Freedom Foundation or, or something. Right. Thing. Um, and she wanted. She has a built in pacemaker slash defibrillator and asked her doctor about, well, what software does it run? The doctor said, excuse me, <laughs> it's, it's closed source. It's, uh, it's closed source. I don't know. And the company got all in a twist that someone would want to audit this. But she said, you know, it's, it's, I trust this with my life every day and I can't audit this for bugs. And we have statistics on how many lines of code you have, you will have X on the average amount of bugs. And because it's, it's my life depends on this thing, I kind of like to see, you know, what's inside me and if it might go berserk or stop working for some reason. Um, so I don't know if that's a patent or closed source argument. That would be copyright. And copyright is, is pretty nasty already, but at least it, at least it has it has some defense. I mean, speaking as a writer, um, if you are in a market where you people, so if the market is such that you can take a work and then sell it, then if you're, if you're um, a writer and you are a small, uh, a small creative person, then it's very hard to compete with a large business who is able to market and sell stuff. And I remember when I made my first business selling video games and I was, I was simply out-marketed by large companies who could spend money on full-page color adverts. Very expensive. I couldn't do that. So if there was no copyright, they would take my games and resell them and make all the money. That's very, very straightforward. That's actually... I can, I can see that. I mean, I would prefer a world where there was a kind of pure share-alike 
where you know a bit more like YouTube, where anything you publish, you have to attribute the original author and any improvements that anyone can take and make their own mixes on. That's much more fun, I think, overall. So is licensing uh, some sort of form of licensing better than what we currently have in copyright? I mean, it's a different world yes. now. We're way more um, connected, and I can easily yes. check the signature and authenticity of any source code. Exactly. Uh, so that I know that IBM stole my idea, and I can make that public, and you know, news news com news agencies will make a will, will have a feast day, or at least so uh, at least social media will you know cry. Right. You know, my my immediate community will go go to bat for me and retweet what awful things IBM did to me. Exactly, and the marketing problem has gone away more or less. Your content is your marketing, which is lovely. So I believe that there is a a better version of copyright which we could be making today based on on, on what we do on, on social media where there are some rules about attribution and about remixing and they are pretty good and they can they can make very positive results and the small creative people aren't punished by those rules they're, they're actually helped by them but and I wrote about this in, a, in my book culture and Empire I have a section on on different forms of property including patents and trademarks and copyright. And you can see there's a reform of copyright, which is possible. You could reform copyright. Trademarks are pretty good. They're actually pretty good. They protect businesses' investment in their reputation pretty well. They're becoming redundant because we have domain names which are almost as good and much cheaper and much more flexible. So that's kind of being replaced just by, by a matter of fact. But if you look at the section where I've written about how to improve the patent system, there's no improvement. It's just burn the thing to the ground. There's literally nothing you can do to improve it. There's no tweaking and there's no regulation. You have to destroy it and burn it. And, you know, that's it. Salt the ashes. There's nothing there to save. Not, there's not a single thing. And I've studied there, that for 10 years. Is there a bad side of copyright as well? I mean, there's the Mickey Mouse copyright um, that's going into the 80th year or something like this. And uh, obviously the precedence that that sets for... Um, other other companies um, so obviously you know copyright not being as evil as uh, as patent um, isn't there a way that that is being abused as well to almost a certain certainly similar extent in terms of its impact it's arguable but it's arguable but really I mean who cares about Mickey Mouse yeah I mean, frankly there is so much good content out there and the um, it's not like it's hard to you know to get stuff if you or even to make stuff. I don't think that there is such a, a rarity of content that we have to really worry if works get locked up for 80 years. Honestly, I don't think that's a problem anymore. Maybe it used to be. I think today that the cost of creation is so low that if there is something missing from our history and culture, then we just recreate it and do it better. I'm okay with that. The problem with patents is you can't recreate and you can't do better. The patent is on an idea. It's on the idea. You own the idea of 20 years. It's locked up for 20 years. You can't build on that idea, and you can't reuse it in any way at all. Um, and they can be very stupid, very simple ideas, very basic things. I had a business once which went... I had to close the business because there was a patent on looking up a mobile phone number in a database and finding a, an email that matched and then sending an email. That was patented that's, in Belgium. That's incredible. Well, that kind of puts in light the you know co cornered... Uh, the, the curved corners on, on an iPad. <laughs> right, right. And the problem there was it wasn't even a patent that had been granted. It was a patent application. But that oh, was right. sufficient for the lawyers that owned this to take my customers to court. Wow. And even before the judge opened his file, I mean, the very fact that there was a legal letter to a customer, they would cancel their contract with us. That was it. So it's, it's such a toxic system. And that's what it's built for. It's built by lawyers, for lawyers, to extort from the market. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I can see now the difference, you know, as the copyright sort of uh, ensuring that previous works are, are somewhat protected, but they don't stifle ideas because you don't need them. Right. Those ideas. That's fair. You can copyright a plot if it's very specific, and you have rights to protect a plot. But it's only the specifics of a plot. If you, you know, the general stories are not are not protectable, and that's how that's fine. We can recreate, we can recreate, and we do all the time. So um, I don't want to keep you. Obviously, have you know, your kids to put to bed, etc. I wanted to ask you one last thing, and I think you've given some thought to this in other um, uh, other interviews, and that's you know, given again what you've learned, um, you know, is there anything that 
uh, you know, you would encourage people to continue to do, to have a more fulfilling life in technology and a more impactful life if that's where they want to, if that's what they want to do and they love this um, area of, of thought and they want to be a, a contributing member to society, be able to feed their kids at the same time. What are your thoughts? Um, you know, <laughs> Wang Zhao, imagine you turn 20 years old uh, tomorrow and uh, you got get another crack at it. You know, what would what would you like, you know, present Peter to have left in a note? <laughs> oh, I, I think I think past Peter did okay. I'm not I'm not going to I think we all do our best and I'm not going to try to play guru to people, but the things that I was happy to have done in my life anyway were when I could work hard, I worked very, very hard and I was able to save when I could save. And when I had children to look after, I was a good father and looked after them with you know, with lots of love and lots of time. And it was, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I mean, I live in a time, as we all do, when things have become cheap. You know, we don't need to be worried about the cost of a pair of shoes anymore, which we used to really worry about, or the cost of a new computer, or the cost of a new phone, or the cost even of, I guess, we still worry about accommodation and about health and about energy, and those costs will come down over time. So I think there's a, a chance that we have to really invest in ourselves and our ability to be with other people and to do things together. And I would say, you know, always aim for things that make you happy, that challenge you, but make you happy. Aim for difficult things, but that you really want to do. Like, I wanted to be a writer and I, I love writing. And I was like, okay, I really want to try to make writing my profession and have on my business card. I'm a writer. How do you do that? Well, you write books. No one cares about your blog. You're a blogger, which is like a second-rate writer. Um, and so you make books, and books are three to six months of work, and you can't feed your kids, so you have to be working and saving money and then working on your book separately. And you do it, and you do the things that you want to and that you dream of, and do them with your, you know, all the passion you can, and be honest about it, and open. And if people hate you, they'll tell you. Hate is a form of love, I've learned. I did a, I did a, <laughs> I did an AMA on Reddit about my book on psychopaths, and oh boy. That was, was one that of the a learning most... experience that you'd want to pass on, the, right, the book that's so controversial? <laughs> controversial book. Well, it was only, it's only controversial when you present it to an audience that hates you. Um, Reddit hates anyone who thinks they're smarter than average. That's, yeah. Never go to Reddit and, and try to show off in any way because they will, they will massacre you. Um, it was a good book. It's a fun book. The book, is, I think, is, I think is valid, valid research, and I think it's, it's successful as a... As a as a guidebook. I'm proud of that book. Yeah. But from the technology perspective, or for people that want to saw such a great success of uh, um, an idea that was based in community, which I think Zero MQ was based of a need um, that wasn't really, it was, be, was answered better by, by Zero MQ than any of the offerings that were commercial. Um, you know, is that a testament to go, just going out there and no matter how silly the idea is or whatever, just, just do it, um, or is that... Let's say you're a young musician and you, you really like music and you have some talent for music, then how do you become a really good musician? How do you play really good gigs? How do you get into a really good band? Well, the answer is you, you play, you practice, and you, you tour. And you have to tour, you have to go in front of audiences, and you have to play in real bands that are trying to survive from the money. And you will not survive from the money. It will destroy you eventually. There's no money in music, but it's by trying and failing. And going through years and years of touring the world with your, your, your buddies and your, your roadsters and whatever, that you actually become a good musician. And it's the same with software. I think you have to be programming. I don't think that if you go into anything, anything else, you, you're going to be learning. You're coding. And you're coding for food. Right? You're writing code, giving it to people who either hate you or love you. You're coding for a live audience, preferably, and doing it with people that you trust and that you're willing to go on the road with. And do this for years and years and years and years. And keep changing. Don't be stuck with one, in one project or one team for too long because it will, it will not teach you new stuff. And it will take 20 years. If you keep programming your whole life, you become a good programmer by the time you're 35, 40. You can be smart when you're 20, but you will not be a good programmer. I can guarantee you. You may be arrogant. I was full of brilliant ideas, 
but they'll be the wrong ideas. They will not make you. I mean, there's a shotgun effect where you throw enough geniuses at the problem, a few will stick, right? A survivor bias. The, the truth is that to become a really good programmer takes a long, long time. It's like becoming a really good musician. And if that's what you want to do, do it. Yeah. Well, that's a great way to um, end uh, an interview. And um, I guess it's time getting late over there. I think you're at 10 p.m. Yeah, it's, yeah, of course, course. it's going now. Um, but um, I'm very humbled that you took the time. And uh, I'm ecstatic that um, you're not on oxygen and you're yeah. something's, do, something's working. So um, I still got my hair. It made my day. So <laughs> just to see you um, in in good spirits, um, not in the hospital at home, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been at least three months since your diagnosis. So um, you know, just as a friend. That's the number one thing to see from this interview, I think. But all the secondary stuff about what to do uh, about our software, uh, how to improve the world, and what we could do better. I think I speak for everyone. And uh, thank you very much for, for taking this time. Well, it's great to see you again, Adam. And thanks for this, thanks for this chat. It's been fun. It's, it's, I think uh, the local community will be very happy to see this. Uh, interview and if things continue the way they are then I definitely will be able to uh, come and visit at, at some short point in time devastated not to go to your live wake and yeah. I keep in the back of my head that that's not going to be uh, that's going to be the best lie you've ever had and we're not going to be at one for a while <laughs> that was a pretty awesome party I have to say and I, I, I wish I was there and I definitely hope that we will see each other soon um, so thank you. Um, happy Father's Day. I don't know if it's Father's Day there, but uh, I think it's International Father's Day. Is, yeah. it, is it international? Okay, so it's not just North America or Canada. So enjoy the rest of your day with your kids. Okay, my friend. Take care. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.